who would take the time to be with each one of us. We thank you. Order our proceedings this afternoon to bring glory and honor to your name, to lift up our young ladies, to lift up our nation, to make it a better place to live, to work, and to do business. We give you all the glory now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Join in by saying, Amen. Amen. some sound on this mic, please. Good morning, everyone. Oh, good afternoon. Yes, I've, I've had a very long morning. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure being here. I see some familiar faces, and um, we were so glad and honored to be able to share in this moment with the Women's Center Foundation of Jamaica. I'm just going to in introduce the persons here on stage with me. Um, to my right, my extreme right, we have Crookseen Cooper Mays, who is the author of Recrowning Purpose, and Shauna K. Ellis, who is an aspiring Edna student and or songbird, and Abigail Robinson is my second in command, the Deputy Executive Director of the Angelic Lady Society. My name is Sarah Lou Morgan Walker, the Executive of Director of the Angelic Lady Society, and all protocols observed to our dignitaries who are here. We will begin and with our scripture reading. Our scripture reading this afternoon will be taken from Lamentation 3, reading from verse 22 to 26. And it reads thus, It is of the Lord memories that we are not consumed because his compassion fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seek him. It is good that every man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. This is a portion of God's holy word. Okay, so we're just going to sing two choruses. If you know them, you can join with us. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. At his right hand, there's just for Oh 
just want to use the opportunity to share my testimony um, very short I know my devotion time period is very short and I just wanted to use the opportunity to share it so that it could be an encouragement to um, you know persons who are here um, not many persons in my circle well many persons in my circle I use it as a way to introduce myself as you would have heard my last name is Morgan Walker I am not married I am adopted at um, birth I, you know, many of you here are pregnant now and have given birth. My mother gave me away to a complete stranger across the walls of Jubilee Hospital. I don't know my parents, I don't know my mother, I don't know my father. And I would have, yeah, I would have grown up with a complete stranger at the time. She didn't know, she was just walking past, going about her daily business, and somebody asked her if she could hold a baby for her. Um, because she could not go back into the hospital, having given birth and discharge with the baby because you know, so fearful that people were leaving babies. And at the time, in the 1980s, people were actually leaving babies in bathroom and in bus shed and on garbage heap or whatever the situation was. And so she could not go back. The lady holds me there for a good number of hours, hoping that she would return. Their last resort was to go to the um, to Luke Lane Police Station to report that I was abandoned and the lady didn't return. The police asked her if she would like to keep me and she said, sure, but she would have to ask her sister. And so that was the beginning. The both of them fostered me for 12 years until at the age of 12 while attending Arden High School, I was legally adopted by the government and had the opportunity to keep both last name. Um, today, I fast forward, today I f got up 6 a.m. to travel from St. Thomas to KPH to accompany that same lady who fostered me, who adopted me to a complete... So she, she was at home for a couple of while bleeding and we went there three weeks ago. And uh, we've been told that, you know, she needs to do a biopsy. And everybody, if you know, if you're in the world and have been listening to the things that have been happening in October, you know what biopsy means and what it could lead to. And so I was standing there with her today while the biopsy was being done. And she would not go into the room without me. Um, I had to hold her hand. Um, I had to sing hymns. <laughs> and choruses and pray because she made the mistake of opening her eyes and see the very long everlasting needle that they were going to use and she panicked. And so I just want to give God thanks for, um, you know, the scripture was read, new mercies every day, give God thanks for, we all in here survived that earthquake. Nobody was crushed under any building. Nobody was slammed with a car because a car swerved. But we all have to give God thanks. And I continue to give God thanks for the fact that she rescued me. Um, it's, it's a different circumstance for everyone, but I continue to give the Lord thanks. And so while um, our songbird sings for us the goodness of God, which is all of us testimony, I'll go around and ensure that our team gives you a token of encouragement from us to you. I love you, Lord, for 
all your mercies never fails me in all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so Of the goodness of God, I love your voice. You have led me to the fire in the darkest times. You are close like no other. I know you as a father. I know you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God and no my life you have been faithful and no my Of the goodness of God. Well, let's hear it one more time for the lovely songbirds. And what I will tell you is that it is such a pleasure to look at them are things, all the different talents that we've been blessed with. I myself am more along the side of an orator or uh, an actress. Let me tell you, if I was a singer, Uno wouldn't tap ear me because I would be singing from glory to glory. So one more time for the angelic ladies, ladies angelic society. Beautiful, beautiful. So we are here for the annual Pamela McNeil lecture on adolescent pregnancy. It is a signatory activity of the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation. It was first delivered in 2018 when the organization celebrated its 40, no, it was first delivered in 2018 when the, the organization celebrate, um, celebrated its 45th anniversary and is named in honor of our first national director. The lecture is delivered in November to coincide with the national focus on education and parenting two pivotal cornerstones of the program for adolescent mothers. So we have some fabulous people in the audience today, right? We do first want to acknowledge a representative from the ministry, um, Dr. Sharon Coburn Robinson here, from the US Embassy, Ms. Maria McKenzie, Ms. Claudette Anglin, Ms. Shazanne McBean, um, the ambassador of the Republic Embassy of Colombia to Jamaica, Her Excellency, Emiliana Bernard Stevenson, or Assistant Chief Education Officer from the Ministry of Education and Information, Ms. Dasmine Kennedy, Director of the Child Diversion in the Ministry of Justice, Mrs. Venetia Clark Lee, Commanding Officer of Sissoka, Jamaica, SSP Maldria Jones Williamson, representatives from the Sam Sharp Teachers College Student Guild, Senior Lecturer, our guest presenter today, Head of the Institute of Gender and Development Studies, Uemona, Dr. Karen Carpenter, 
the chairman of the board of directors and all other representatives from the chairman of the board of directors of the foundation, Mrs. Debbie Ann Brown Salmon, and the director of monitoring, evaluation, and research for the National Family Planning Board, Dr. Tasmore Crawford. If I did not mention your name, please forgive me. Just come across, tell me, and I will big you up in our next round. We will now hear from the chairperson from the Board of Directors for the Women's Center Jamaica Foundation, Mrs. Debian Brown Salmon, to do our partnership reflection. Please welcome her. No, no, that's not looking correct. Yes. So, Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone, again. And I'm saying everyone be because we have a full room, a full room, save and accept one or two empty chairs. And that's all right, because um, I don't know if we can get um, from or able technologies at the back there. How many people are online? 75 people wow. online and growing, right? Of course, because as we go throughout the course of today's program, more people are going to join. So I'm excited. And already, it sounds exciting based on what's been happening. Um, our angelic group who was here before, thank you so much for your delivery of um, our short devotional piece. But everybody in the room, and to those of you online, welcome and thank you. Uh, I'm not giving the partnership um, presentation, but I'm certainly up here to welcome every single one of you who have joined us today for this, another iconic year when we can celebrate in this fashion again and have another lecture delivered to us on teenage pregnancy, which is what we are about, the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation, continuing girls' education, pregnant or just had a baby, as long as you qualify, we are here for you. Before I start, and I'm sure my friends, my colleagues, are tired of hear me say, hearing me say, happy birthday to the Women's Center. This year, we are celebrating 45 years. 45 glorious years. Let me see the bright spark in the audience now. What year did we start? So, oh, I just said bright spark. <laughs> All right, the bright spark on the podium. When did we start? 45 years. What year did we start? 1978. Which one of you don't hear about 1978? None of you. 1978. 45 years, ladies and gentlemen. And it is going to be, I mean, we're almost finished, but we are going to be celebrating. And today is kind of like a part of the celebration, even though we do this every year for the Pamela McNeil Lecture. But nonetheless, we will not forget that we're celeb celebrating 45 glorious years. Today I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming our special guests, viewers, and attendees in front of me to another year of our annual Pamela McNeil Lecture. We have been doing this since 2018, as our moderator had said, and today we are grateful we can host another special edition of a needed conversation, the topic of adolescent pregnancy. Our theme this year is adolescent pregnancy, pregnancy breaking the cycle protecting our girls. Our very able guest speaker, Dr. Karen Carpenter, will deliver her presentation on the topic, and I'll leave the introduction for um, 
I believe it's Mrs. Martin Berry who will introduce our guest speaker later on. And I'm sure it will be a very engaging and eye-opening, in a good way, Dr. Carpenter, presentation that she's going to deliver. And on that note, welcome everyone online and in person here to the very best day ever. If you didn't think it was your best day, after this presentation, you're going to agree with me. And in our midst, I'd like to acknowledge the following persons, and I'm going to start with the persons on the podium, since they are closest to me. And that would be directly to my right, our moderator, master, sorry, mistress, as she said earlier, mistress of ceremony, Miss Shana K. Burns. And she's been doing very well. Give her a clap. Give her a nice clap. Next to Miss Burns is our guest speaker, as I mentioned before, Dr. Karen Carpenter. And next to Dr. Carpenter is Ambassador of the Republic Embassy of Col Colombia to Jamaica, Her Excellency Emiliana Bernard Stevenson, who is really Jamaican, but she, you know, was born in another place, right? <laughs> next to um, Her Excellency is Principal Director of the Bureau of Gender Affairs, Mrs. Sharon Coburn Robinson. And Mrs. Sharon Coburn Robinson is foundation member of the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation. She's a past student, and she is now working alongside the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation or assist with our sister agency, the Bureau of Gender Affairs. I don't know if we have um, the next uh, person or persons I'm going to mention, or friends from the U.S. Embassy. I don't know if they're here. Not here as yet. They're on their way. Um, commanding Officer Sissoka, Jamaica Constabular Force, SSP Maldria Jones-Williams. There you go. Welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Assistant Chief Education Officer from the Ministry of Education and Inform Information, Ms. Dasmeen Kennedy. Oh, Ms. Kennedy, there you go. Right in front of, of us. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure if Sam Sharp Teachers College, um, the Guild of Students are here as yet. They're, oh, they're online. Welcome, Sam Sharp. Welcome. Senior lecturer and head of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies at University, well, Dr. Carpenter, I'm sorry. That's you, Dr. Carpenter, of course. And I see here chairman of the board of directors, but that's, that's me. I don't need to mention me. But I'd like to mention that my board of directors are here, two of them at least, and I'm happy to say that I am happy that you're here. Three, well, Mrs. Robbie. <laughs> you got your special welcome, but she is a member of the board of directors. But Mr. Glenn Campbell and our dear, I like to call her just Rev. Just our dear Rev, Jennifer Owens, who <laughs> delivered the prayer earlier, is here as well. And I, I'm happy they're here. They support every single venture that this center puts on. And I'm always happy when I have the support as members of my team. And have I left anyone? Oh, Director of Monitoring, Evaluation, and Research National Family Planning Board, Dr. Tasman Crawford, who is here in the front. Welcome, members of staff of the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation, Mr. McLeggan, Director of Corporate Affairs, Mrs. Martin Berry, Director of Field Operations, somewhere there, other members of staff, our stakeholders, our students, our girls who are in-house today as well. Welcome, 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 and again, last but not least, to our viewers online. Thank you all for being here, and as I said before, I know you're going to enjoy this discussion that we're going to have, and our presenter is going to make it 
so interesting for us that we will even want to continue the conversation, which is what we want um, after this evening's presentation. So welcome again, and I hope that you will, at the end of today's presentation, have a better perspective, understanding, and appreciation of the role that we all need to play in breaking that cycle for the protection of our girls. Welcome again, and thank you, everybody. I'll hand over to the moderator. All right, thank you, thank you. So who realized that I did make my mistake with the maths? I didn't realize, I'm gonna catch myself in a become saying no, that maths are not maths in. But we did realize that we are now celebrating in 2023 our 45th anniversary, right? So I know one of the things that the Women's Centre Foundation is celebrating, what I am going to dub is hashtag 45 and strong, 45 and moving, 45 and great, right? And so I know we have a bunch of young people in here and I want us to ensure that we take out our phones, right? And we do the selfie and we tag at Women's Center Jamaica, right? Which is, which is the, the, the handle on Instagram. And then we hashtag 45 and, 45 and alive. You hear them just do it. Hashtag for, oh, it's me. You see, I was asking, we never get that. Thank you. Hashtag 45 and alive, and we tag Right, let me just make sure we have it right. Hashtag at Women's Center JA, right? Because we know so we're in the social media age, and them now go out, do we? So when you get some time, hashtag you and your row, um, take a picture of you and the person beside you, and let's blow up social media with this wonderful, wonderful celebration that we're having. So as we said earlier, there is some slight changes to the program. So right now, we will be taking um, our partnership reflection, first from Vanessa Clark Lee, the Director of Child Diversion, the Acting Director of Child Diversion from the Ministry of Justice, which will be directly followed by our feature presentation and guest lecture from Dr. Karen Carpenter. So let's welcome Ms. Vanessa Clark Lee from the Child Diversion of Ministry of Justice. Master of Ceremony, Ms. Shana K. Barnes. Uh, I understand the U.S. Embassy staff is not here yet. Um, Mrs. Shazan McBean, Ambassador of the Republic of, the, of Colombia to Jamaica, His Excellency Emiliana Bernard Stevenson, Chief Education Officer, Dasmin Kennedy, Commanding Officer Sisoka, Jamaica Constabulary Force, SSP Maldria Jones Williams, Sam Sharp Teachers College, Students Guild, I understand you're online. Senior Lecturer, Head of Department, Institute for Gender and Development Studies, UWI Mono, Dr. Karen Carpenter. It is my pleasure this afternoon to bring greetings and to tell you about the partnership that we have forged with the Women's Center Foundation of Jamaica. I am Marvet Fair. I am representing Ms. Vanessa Clark Lee. The challenges faced by the criminal justice system, physical and mental health services, according to research by the World Health Organization, the Center for Disease Control, have their origins in childhood, from tantrums and aggressions to anxiety and depression there are many maladaptive behaviors serving as precursors to criminality and law breaking, manifesting starting within the adolescent years and continuing into adulthood. Left undetected and untreated, maladaptive behaviors will not only continue, 
but become worse and difficult to treat or become resistant to any form of intervention aimed at change. Why is it so important to understand and address these behaviors? Because they can have significant impact on a child's future. As the research published in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health points out, maladaptive behaviors can lead to poor academic performance, social difficulties, and even mental health problems later in life. That is why it is crucial to identify and address these behaviors earlier on so that children can develop the skills and strategies they need to survive. This is the reason behind the Social Justice Unit of the Ministry of Justice, including the Child Diversion Program, aims to implement measures for dealing with children who are alleged, accused of, or recognized as having infringed the penal law without resorting to the formal justice system. The Child Diversion Program aims to, and I notice that our aims are similar to that of the Women's Center Foundation of Jamaica. Our aims to rehabilitate children who have committed a diversion offense, to reduce the number of children exposed to the criminal justice system, and to empower communities to accept our children when they have done wrongs back into their, their midst. The child diversion utilizes a range of intervention methods, works collaboratively with branches and units within the social justice unit of the Ministry of Justice and stakeholders, including organizations such as the Women's Center, the Drug Abuse Council, mentors, justices of the peace, and many other groups who provide services to children served by the program. Some of the services we offer include counseling, sexual and reproductive counseling and education, mentorship, remedial training, vocational training, community services, and conflict management. It is in the area of sexual and reproductive counseling and education that we have forged a partnership with the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation. The Women's Center is a pioneer formal organization for addressing concerns of adolescent mothers in Jamaica. The center provides outreach services to adolescent mothers who are unable to reach main centers. They provide education and skills training to improve levels of employment and productivity among Jamaican, Jamaica's youth. And they also provide counseling and other health-related services. Today, we recognize the partnership of the Women's Center Foundation of Jamaica as our premier partner in the provision of sexual and reproductive counseling and education to the males in our program. So I was looking at the website prior to coming here, and I'm certain that it must be for good reasons why that is not a part of what I see when I, when I log on, that the Women's Center does not only cater to girls and, and females, but they are an integral part of dealing with our boys as well who, as you will notice, have come in conflict with the law. So today we recognize the partnership with Women's Center as our premier partner for providing sexual and reproductive counseling and education to the males in our program whose offense is breaking the law as it pertains to sex with an underage minor. The Women's Center has been with us from inception, and all the males who come to us are, are referred to the Women's Center in all the parishes that they exist, and it is the Women's Center who does the sexual and reproductive education aspect of our program. We recognize the challenges 
of dealing with what is sometimes accepted as a cultural norm. So what we have recognized is in many cases, it is okay for boys, teenage boys to have sex with teenage girls, have sex with their girlfriends. Many of them seem, or when they come to us, will tell us that they did not know or were not aware that they were breaking the law. Because it's a part of the norm in their schools and in their communities. Nothing seemed to be wrong with having sex with girls. But we find it difficult and we observe that the challenge exists when the person who is having sex with our teenage girls are men who are older and who will not benefit from this program where we send them to the Women's Center to get re-educated and retrained. So we applaud your efforts and look forward to a mutually beneficial and continued partnership as together we, Child Diversion Branch of the Ministry of Justice, Social Justice Unit, and the Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation reduce the number of children with social, mental, and behavioral issues who remain undetected and untreated. Thank you. All right, so while we welcome the Director of uh, Field Operations for the Foundation, Ms. Beverly Martinberry, to introduce our guest speaker, we pause to acknowledge the presence of the U.S. Embassy online. Everybody tell them, how did you? How did you? <laughs> awesome, awesome, please. We welcome Ms. Beverly, um, yes, Ms. Beverly Martinberry to introduce our guest speaker. Let's welcome her. Esteemed guests at the head table, representatives from the Ministry of Education and Youth, representatives from the Ministry of Justice, Women's Center of Jamaica Foundation directors, uh, staff, students, other invited guests, good afternoon. It is my honor this afternoon to introduce a woman whose work is focused on gender. This woman is the head of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies and a senior lecturer at the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus. She is a licensed counseling psychologist in Jamaica and a Florida board certified clinical sexologist. In the area of research, she runs the Caribbean Sexuality Research Group where she operates a free public clinic at the University Hospital of the West Indies. In her sojourn in educating the populace on love and sex and gender, she is the author of the book, Love and Sex, The Basic Questioning Caribbean Jewish Identity, Interweaving Tapestries of Sexuality and Culture and Language, Race and the Global Jamaican. Most noteworthy, she is also the host of Love and Sex on Facebook Watch every Tuesday between the hours of 9 and 10 p.m. Please put your hands together and help me welcome Dr. Karen Carpenter. very much for the introduction and certainly for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be celebrating 45 years with you because I'm only slightly over 45, yes? <laughs> we shouldn't begin with a lie. <laughs> I'm very pleased to be speaking to the young women who are here today, most importantly, as well as colleagues and friends and invited guests because it's important, the topic that we're talking about. And I wanted to begin by laying some kind of foundation for why it is that we are talking about adolescent pregnancy. Adolescent pregnancy doesn't happen in a vacuum. As all the young ladies who've experienced it know, and the not so young ladies who've experienced it know, 
that there's something that comes before the actual pregnancy. And that's the thing that we tend not to talk about in this country. And of course, it is adolescent sex. Yes, whether that is sexuality in its broader sense or whether that is intercourse in the narrow sense. So I want us to understand how adolescence sexuality plays a role in adolescent pregnancy and what we need to be doing to address these issues. Okay. So I want to jump right in because I'm that kind of person who jumps right in. And I want us to look at the problem with adolescent sexuality. And the problem I find with adolescent sexuality is not adolescents. The problem with adolescent sexuality is adults. We seem to have sexual amnesia once we become parents. None of us remembers the flutters of the boy who today we don't actually like, but when we were 15, you know, you had a book with a book. Nobody seems to remember that, you know, as Jamaicans say, your skin catch a fire when you see somebody, or you think that young lady has the smoothest skin. We seem to forget that once we become adults. And many parents pretend that they had no sexual desires, they have no sexual interest, and their children came about because a stork dropped them from the sky. We really need as adults to be much more socially responsible. That is not socially responsible behavior, and it's not sexually responsible behavior. So I find one of the main challenges that we face in this country, and believe me, I've been repeating this message for over 30 years, is that parents and adults do not remember what it was like to be a teenager. The fact that teenagers get pregnant at all should signal to us that there is an issue that is both universal, because it happens in all countries, Jamaica doesn't have the monopoly on teen pregnancy. It happens at various points in your adolescent journey. So the fact that it's happening as frequently as it does should make us understand that it is actually a product of nature. And if we are not going to look at the developmental issues related to pregnancy, sexuality, and maturation, then we're never going to solve the problems that we think that adolescent sexuality poses, or the real problems that come about because young women get pregnant early and have a second pregnancy soon after. So those who don't have the luxury of coming to the women's center often get pregnant very soon after the first child. And that reduces their chances in life. So let's look at briefly what we're going to um, talk about. And I don't read from slides, as you will notice. So the slides are for you. <laughs> so let's look at the overview. Some of the things we want to touch on briefly, and I'm going to give you a smorgasbord of things to think about. That means a variety. Adolescent psychology. I'm a psychologist. My specialization is sex therapy. And therefore, I get to speak to people every day about sex. I used to say I have the best job in the world. I still think I do. <laughs> so we have to speak very plainly about sexuality when you work in psychology and sexuality as a combination. We want to look at adolescent sexual practices. What's really happening in Jamaica? What role does your family play? What role does your peer group play? And what role does popular culture, music, and the economy play? And briefly look at that recent research that we've done on this topic. Because yes, at the University of the West Indies, we do research real life, yes? Then we want to look at what social emotional intelligence is, and that's what will bring us to our summary. And we're going to do that. So this is like a quick lesson on what you are and who you are and why we do the things that we do as adolescents. So we can move on. I want to point out that in sexuality studies, we make a distinction between childhood and adolescence. I am concerned that even internationally, even with the UN, we have begun to call everyone under 18 a child. I'm concerned that we're not recognizing developmentally what is happening in your biology. I am concerned that we are not acknowledging our organ development. Within your body, within your brain, changes are taking place. 
which moves you out of that category called child into preteen and then teen and then late adolescence. And at each of those developmental stages, your brain is different. At each of those stages, your body is different. And at each of those stages, your hormone levels are different and you are developing towards adulthood. So one of the things we used to say about adolescents is that they're not what they were, but they're not what they're going to be. It's that interesting and problematic stage where you're trying to define yourself. So I prefer to use the term adolescent rather than child because that for me suggests someone under seven years old. Good. We're talking about people in the pre-adolescent and adolescent stages. And we want to look at some of the national family planning issues that have been raised in recent reports. You'll see on the left the conventions that Jamaica has signed on to. Every gender student at the university knows these conventions because we drill it into them, because it's important to know what your country has agreed to do. So if your country has agreed to these conventions, it means that the laws of the country must follow. And not all of our laws have been updated to follow the conventions that we've signed on to. On the right, in red, you will see some of the concerns that the National Family Planning Board still has about these laws. And these concerns include the fact that we do not have comprehensive sexuality education in our schools. We have an HFLE curriculum that is used ad hoc. That means whenever people feel like. And they ignore the portions that they don't like. I've been told in schools that I have spoken to about, especially boys' school, that I've spoken to about the implementation of the HFLE curriculum, health and family life education curriculum, that boys don't get pregnant. When we take that kind of cavalier attitude to our young women, because that's actually what we're saying, since boys don't bear the burden of pregnancy, it's okay not to tell young people about their sexuality. We have to be advocates for comprehensive sexuality education so that young people know their bodies and their biology, their emotions and their psychological responses, so that their curiosities are addressed. Part of the reason we get involved sexually is because we hear it feels good. And yet we walk around telling people that sex is bad. Now, I don't know why adults would engage in this bad thing for most of their lives. If it is so bad, we must tell the truth about sexuality. Sex is good. Sex feels good. And because it is good, you want to share that with someone who you respect. Because it is something very valuable, you want to share it with someone who's valuable. We have to change the messaging. We have to tell young people the truth. We also don't have the kind of legal and regulatory restrictions around some of these activities that we ought to have. And that is problematic. Our laws do not align. They don't line up. So the law that we refer to as the uh, age of consent law, I frankly do not like that term. It is the age of prosecution. It is the age at which if you engage with a young person under that age, you are liable for prosecution. So why are we forgetting the prosecution part of it and speaking about the consent? We have challenges because the consent can only be had with someone who is capable of consenting and taking the consequences of that consent. So we have to rethink the way we position ourselves. But then, you see, if sex is bad, then we can talk about the age of consent. But if sex is good and something to aspire to, then you can talk about the age of prosecution for anyone who troubles a young person who is 15 or under. And so we have to rethink that. Adolescent sexual and reproductive health rights really refer to that group of young people as yourselves, and I won't belabor the fact 
because we already said this, yes? So we can move on from this one. It's young people between 10 and 18 years. When you get to 19, you're a young adult. Okay. One of the things that we have to consider, which rarely enters our classrooms, is the issue of developmental stages. All of us are at a different developmental stage. Everybody in this room can form little groups that signal different developmental stages. And in the adolescent, whether they're early adolescent or late adolescent, your brain function is different. For instance, a child cannot make hypothetical statements or hypothetical thinking. Under a certain age, you do not have the capacity for thinking what if. That's called a hypothetical statement. The what if equation is very, very poorly developed in young children. And as we enter adolescence, we begin in the brain to develop the capacity for thinking, if I do this, then that will happen. But that capacity has to be fed with information. Not fiction, not myth, because it's a point at which young people are trying to decide, who am I? And you're looking around at the world and you're saying, what if? What if Johnny touched me and it feel good? What if? Yes? And you go to mommy, you go to daddy, or you go to auntie, you go to grandma, and they say to you, no, no, but I bother your head about that. And I hear thing that, a big people business. But they know that when they were 14 and 15, they were having these emotions. But they've got the amnesia, and they're not telling you that they felt the same thing. Yes? So the what ifs have to be informed by information. fiction, not storytelling. All adolescents have a sex life. Every adolescent, your children who are adolescents, your nieces, nephews, cousins, brothers, etc., have a sex life. Whether that sex life is with themselves or with somebody else. The problem with adolescent sexuality as a society is that adolescents have the developmental capacity for sexual engagement, but do not have the ability to be socially responsible for the results of sexual engagement. So if your body matures into sexual desire in adolescence and continues to mature as you enter young adulthood to prepare you for child rearing and childbearing, then you need the information about your body at that stage. You don't need for someone to tell you and are you hurting that? Leave that to big people. Because that won't help you to defend yourself against the advances that you're going to receive and also your own emotions and feelings. So there's a gap between our physical development, our mental development, and our social responsibilities. And that is what we need to address. How socially responsible are we for taking on what comes with sexual activity? Because we want to be sexually healthy. The factors that actually interplay and affect adolescent sexuality is your biology, which is set up, you're like a hormone pool. Any 15-year-old I know, it's like the hormones are bouncing off every part of their body, right? You are hormonal, you're supposed to be, because you're developing a reproductive capacity. You get your secondary sex characteristics, you are supposed to. If you are developing in a healthy fashion, these things are happening universally for every adolescent in the world. And when it is not happening, we're worried. When it is not happening and you go to the doctor, the doctor puts you on a regimen, the doctor gives you medication, the doctor does tests. So it is normal and natural for you to develop. But you also need some social responsibility that goes with that. The social factors are going to affect how you view this development. Your psychosexual information is going to affect that. And your psychological self, who you are as an individual psychologically, is going to affect that. Not every adolescent responds the same way to sexual advances, to sexual urges, to all sorts of things that are sexual. Because we're individuals as much as we are influenced by peer pressure and by the popular culture.
When we look at medicine versus myth, if we actually look at the biology of human beings, we will realize that it is natural for certain parts of your body to become erogenous zones. Big word to say, when someone excites you there, touches you there, talks about that part of your body, you become excited. Why are we not telling young people this prior to pregnancy? Why are we hiding natural and normal biology from young people when they need it the most? When we teach what they call sex education in schools, we're actually teaching what I consider animal husbandry. They're teaching how you reproduce as a mammal, but they're not teaching what your emotions are doing inside of you. They're not teaching that when Johnny touched you, you're going to tingle. And mama and papa said, no, nothing like that never happened to them. The only thing they ever feel is when they stand up in the church and say hallelujah. Not true. We have to start telling the truth. I've been saying this for 30 years. We have to tell the truth about how good and glorious and wonderful sex is. And that is why we should be careful with it. Not because it's dirty and hidden and dark. Because it is something valuable, we ought to treat it with value. But if no one ever tells you that the tingle that you feel is normal and natural and everybody feel it, you feel that Johnny is very special. He's like a magician. Yes? He alone can make you feel that. No, don't believe that. So if you look at the charts, uh, the top and the bottom on the right, you will see the hormone levels in the human body, natural hormone levels, that are going to rise during adolescence and diminish as we get older, both in men and women. So at the peak of your early adulthood, 19 to 24 years, 25 to 35 years, you're gonna have the maximum hormone levels. You will also have developed your thinking about what if. That brain development stops and matures at about 24, 25. So even at 18, while you're very excited, you still don't have the answers to all the what ifs. But if we told you this, you would know that you have to slow down. You would know that you have to think twice. And if we were honest with you about what happened to us, then you would take our examples and do differently in your lives. So the way we've treated with adolescent sexuality and sexuality in general in this country is that we've been very disease oriented. We talk about STIs, we talk about HIV, we talk about all the bad things that can happen to all the bad people and we think those bad things only happen to bad people, right? Good people don't get STIs, good people don't get pregnant, good people don't have any of these problems. Not true. Any one of us can get it. But we have to treat it with some kind of universal thought. We also teach that pleasure is deviant. If it feels good, you must run away. Which adolescent do you know will run away from nice touch and nice feelings? I've not met them. And I've dealt with adolescents for most of my adult lives. We teach sex as reproduction only. And we do not teach, because often we don't know, that for every 1,000 sex acts that are committed, one child is born. The reverse is true. For every child born, a thousand sex acts have been committed on the planet. Sex is important, sex is good, and sex is a basic right, because without sex, we do not stay on the planet. The species requires sexual activity. The when, the how, the protections, the safety, those are the things that we need to teach. Sex is natural, and in Jamaica, when we do surveys about sexuality, we have folks saying that, yes, sex is a natural part of everything. We can move on to the adolescents. We also spoke to adolescents, and this is the research that I'd like to share with you. We spoke to adolescents some uh, 10 or so years ago, and one of our PhD candidates looked at emotional social intelligence and adolescent sexuality. 
because we had in mind this issue of teenage pregnancy. What is it that's happening in Jamaican adolescents in particular that makes them behave in the ways that they do? And let's look at some of the findings. If you have a poor family and parental bond, it might, these, not, not everybody who gets pregnant as an adolescent has all of these factors, but it might weaken your bond with the family and that means that you may look for your, your help and support outside the family. The Jamaican family itself operates with a double standard. Boys must go out and they must, what do they say? Tie, what, loose the bull and tie the heifer? Yes? Come on, we're big people here. So we let our boys run randomly around. I want to know who they're supposed to have sex with. Who you think they're going to have sex with? Who you think they're attracted to? Their own peer group. That's natural. So if you tell one set that they must go and do whatever they want and the other set must always be good girls and stay inside and not have sex, it's never going to work. We, we cannot keep seeing the result of that kind of teaching and continue to teach in the same way. We encourage girls to have sexual relations for transactional purposes. That's part of our culture and that's something that we have to stop. We also generally do not discuss sex, and I think it's because Jamaican parents don't have the vocabulary. And I'm going to be clear about what I mean about the vocabulary. For many years I worked in the Jamaican language unit as a language advocate. And that means that when we speak a language we do not write, and write a language we do not speak, and mama and papa trying to talk to you about those things sexual and they don't have the language in Jamaican, we have a problem. We are speaking to our young people in English, a language they speak but do not write, not their home language, and we're not giving mama and papa the tools to talk to the young people in the home about their bodies. We're using all kinds of fictional terms for the genitals. Yes? You know some of them. Some are vegetables, some are animals, right? But you use terms that don't have anything to do with the human body. Yes, we must teach the young people all of the words that are used, but we must also teach them the biologically correct terms. They must know what their body is made up of. Okay. Peers are a big influence, and often young people will tease each other, push each other towards behaviors that they themselves are not doing. You know, do this yet. What happened to you? Yes? But they themselves may not be doing it. They want to find out from you if you are doing it. And we foolishly jump and do these things because we think we want to be popular or we want to be the big girl, yes? Peer group, very important. But the peer group also has to do with masculinity and young men. Because young men are encouraged to become sexually active early and their sexual activity is a part of their being masculine. Man a man. If you're not a man, then you're not having sex. And if you're not having sex, what kind of man are you? And if you have a one burner, we have a problem. Yes? So the ways in which we socially and culturally encourage young men to become sexually active is problematic. Okay? All right. I've left a number of references here. Society encourages young girls, of course, to prove their fertility through pregnancy. And then religion tends to influence our sexual attitudes. Women's Health Survey of 2016 showed that most women believed at least two or three statements that were precursors to sexual violence. Women reported that they believed in submission to men even when it was violent. And that influence is coming from the church. The church has to answer for itself, it has to be more responsible socially in educating young people. And you're going to see why when we look at the social emotional um, aspects. We can go to the emotional social intelligence. If you understand how the human brain works along with the human biology, you cannot tell young people the nonsense and the myths that we've been telling them. We cannot, as adults, ask them to abstain when we do not abstain. We didn't practice abstinence when we were their ages, and we're now pretending 
that if we have two children, we only had sex twice. Come on. Let's be responsible. Emotional social intelligence is about the intrapersonal, interpersonal, your adaptability, and how you manage stress. And one of the things that the researcher, Samantha Longman Mills, found out in looking at Jamaican adolescents is that people with high emotional social intelligence were more likely to take more risks. And when she found this out, she was distressed. If you are able to have good intrapersonal, interpersonal, stress management, and adaptability skills, you can take more risks. People who have low emotional social intelligence do not have great adaptability, do not manage stress very well, aren't able to do the interpersonal, which is to negotiate condom use, and aren't able to do the interpersonal. So the intra and the inter are diminished. They don't know themselves very well. And these are the people who tend to be more cautious, less risk-taking, but it also means they have no negotiation skills. If the man says so, so. So we have to develop in our young people emotional social intelligence so that they can manage risk. These were 500 adolescents that we studied. And we can move to the next one because we have lots of little facts here, but I don't think we have the time for it. And they were between 14 to 17 years. It was interesting to note that the young people who were between 13 and 15, first of all, of the young people that we included in the study, half of them were already sexually active in school. And they were in school doing these surveys. They were already sexually active, right? And what we found was that among those young people, 13 to 15 years old, 50% of them sexually active. As it got older, we got 70 plus percent sexually active. So once we passed the age of 15, which is the age of sexual initiation in this country, sexual activity goes up, yes? So if that is the case and they're not yet 18 and they're not yet adult, why are we withholding information? These are facts, these are not fiction. If you look at the red markers, you can see that students with good social emotional regulation skills participate in more risky activities. Students with good interpersonal skills less likely to participate in risky sexual activities. Why? If you have good interpersonal skills, you're going to be able to negotiate. The better the adolescent stress management skills, the more risks they take. Make sense? If you as an adult can manage your stress levels better, you can be braver sexually. The same thing applies to adolescents. Those who can manage the stress can take more risks. Our school age adolescent, and this is a profile, and you can bring up the whole profile. The, uh, they had very average interpersonal skills. They had average social and emotional skills. Between the ages of 14 to 15, 58.4% of them were already sexually active. By the time we got to 15 to 17, 77% were sexually active. And this is 10 years ago in our schools in this country. More than half agree with two or more statements that support transactional sex. I'm gonna read that again. More than half agree with two or more statements that say it's okay to exchange sex for care, for money, for the phone, for the phone card, for anything transactional. And a majority agree that when a girl is having a boyfriend, she needs to give him some sex. Barry Chavans long ago pointed out that the key to sexual access among adolescents is that if the boy says he loves the girl, the girl will give him sex. She doesn't have to believe that he loves her. That is the key that opens the lock. And young men learn that they can be like cartel, eh? Me love you, me love you baby. You know, I'm a picnic. So immediately, love equals sex. 
And that is why we have to separate the myth of love and sex being connected, and that sex only takes place in love. And we need to educate our young people that these two things are not the same. We need to educate a lot of big people too, because they still think it's the same. These are not the same thing. One is a biological urge, and the other one is an emotional connection. And they're not the same. If they happen together, wonderful. But they often don't. So we can move on. The Ministry of Health has mounted many campaigns, some more successful than others. And there are some that no matter where you go, if you raise the topic of the campaign, everyone will know it. And despite the Ministry of Health raising all of these campaigns, mounting these campaigns, bringing the message to young people, we have pharmacies and grocery stores that will not sell a young person a condom. We have pharmacies and grocery stores that believe that the natural punishment for sexual activity when you're an adolescent is a pregnancy. These are adults who are preventing young people from access to the thing that will help them to finish their education because very few of you have the ability to come to the Women's Center. This is a privilege. It is a very needed service, but it's a privilege. A majority of our young women who get pregnant do not continue their education, become subject to sexual and intimate partner abuse, and have very few chances in life. We have to stop that. So I encourage those pharmacies. I used to offer $4,000 to any pharmacy who would give young people condoms. I think if they're brave enough to come and buy it, and they're sexually active, and I know that they're sexually active, then we have to abide by the conventions we've signed to. The conventions we've signed to say that we will protect adolescent sexuality by giving them adequate information and access to prevention of pregnancy and STIs. We are not holding up our end of the bargain. So, we already spoke about the contributing factors, the socioeconomic factors, age of initiation being 15 years, Ministry of Health messages, those that are good or great, and those that miss the mark, miss the mark, because we tend to associate abstinence with some kind of lack of pregnancy. Abstinence programs have failed around the world. An individual can abstain, but you cannot ask an entire population to abstain. That makes no sense, not when we know that the age of initiation is 15 years. Lack of comprehensive sexuality education I've mentioned before, this is the call to action, this is what we need to do. And our socio-religious political messaging has to be aligned with what our country is experiencing. We cannot turn a blind eye to the plight of our youth and then say we are responsible adults. We are very irresponsible. We're not taking care of our youth. We're not giving the, them the ammunition and the information they need to have healthy and long and productive lives. So I'm calling us all to action. Barriers to health, we've said them. Parents are not keeping pace with their adolescents. Most parents don't even know what Google is. They think it's a person, yes? Parents are not educated to the facts themselves. Schools are unwilling to talk about sexuality and they you know, go around the topic, they don't implement the HFLE curriculum, and religious barriers are there as well that suggest that whatever a man wants, a man ought to get from a woman. Whatever a boy wants, he ought to get from a girl. All he has to say is, I love you. Because isn't that the magic? Okay, we need to stop fooling ourselves and we need to stop the denial. We need information and education, not denial. Thank you. So once again, can I have a round of applause for Dr. Carpenter and that awesome, awesome call to action as she, um, as she just stated for us as adults in the room to take greater accountability in how we approach the education of our young people. So once again, thank you so much. I know you would have seen a Q&A option here, but as Dr. Carpenter has to unfortunately leave us, 
um, and she does uh, regret this, I'm sure. We, we must give her grace as we give ourselves grace and our young people grace. So once again, uh, Dr. Carpenter, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation for us as we give you greetings. Thank you so much. What we are going to do now is have greetings from the ambassador, um, em Emiliana Bernard Stevenson, who will bring us some greetings, and then we will move through the program. And I know we're excited. Remember that we're still taking pictures. Hashtag 45 and correct. Let's welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, greeting to everyone. I am very um, happy to be in this space sharing this topic. Um, it's something that moved me because since the last 35 years, I became a feminist. And a feminist is a person who defends women and girls' human rights rights for education, rights for life, right for equal treatment, right to access of information, right to do um, economic and social development. So since I am here um, in the last five months, I have been searching for um, organizations, group, people who have been working on gender issue and um, women human rights. So a friend recommended me uh, this organization, <laughs> Mrs. Brown. And um, I was very happy uh, to meet you three weeks ago and learn a few and uh, was delighted of what you are doing. Um, I just uh, happy to be in this space because that is um, what I love to do. I love social work and I am not a diplomat. I was just taken from the community and sent to, <laughs> to Jamaica. <laughs> so uh, I am searching for my, my roots and also I'm searching for my roots of my family. My great grandfather, you can listen how me talk to, okay? <laughs> I talk just like Uno. So if you listen to my talking, my accent, I am Jamaica descent, okay? My great-grandfather, Samuel Stevenson Cowell, was from St. Elizabeth, okay? So Ali Stevenson should be my relatives. <laughs> uh, so I'm um, um, like how you say, Yard girl, neither yard girl too. Um, because I um, was born in the island of San Andres, which is part of Colombia. And um, in San Andres, our mother tongue is patois. So me, that want patois, talk all day, all night. <laughs> so I feel like I'm home, um, being here in Jamaica. And i very happy uh, to take part of this program. And um, in your 45 years, Mrs. Barron, counted my 45 donation, okay? <laughs> and <laughs> other support. I am encouraging the Diplomatic Corps to have a donation to this organization uh, because I believe you are doing a great great, great jobs, you know? Giving girls a second opportunity, that's great. That is, maybe we do not understand it at this moment, but when girls face life after the process and can access to education and be a professional, that is great, you know? Uh, maybe no one pays you for do that, but your heart will be filled of happiness and joy. That's, that's our tax, great? So um, I just want to, to share with you that um, I am here in a mission since the last five months, and I really um, 
engage with social and community work. That's my, that's my task in life and that's what I love to do. And I am happy too because I am uh, meeting people who I um, always watch on TV, Mr. Glenn Taitos. I, <laughs> I used to see your program in, in Colombia, in the island of San Andres. I <laughs> used to watch your program. And I am very happy because I, I saw you when I entered here, and I say, oh my goodness, this is like my happiness too. And um, you and Mr. Samuel, Oliver Samuel, I used to watch a lot in San Andres because it's of the language, you know, and of the culture. If you uh, go to San Andres, you will find, as how Colombian people call us, a small Jamaica. A small Jamaica, in culture, in everything. We got to be run down. We do for we jerk things, and we do a lot of Jamaican food, you know? Down to porridge, we got all day we drink in the porridge. <laughs> so really, it's like, it's like, you know, I have been um, searching for my great-grandparents since the last 10, 15 years. I, am be, I have been here since five times, you know, looking for the Stevenson, checking the Stevenson, because I am concerned of my heritage and mom used to always learn us to link with family so in san andres we are like one big family you know we still live in your big yards so you can find the stevenson yards the robinson yards the uh, gordon yard the pomir and the farm you know by yards so uh, we stick together and um, we are the only Stevenson in San Andres, my great-grandfather legacy. So um, I really uh, happy to um, share with you and Mrs. Brown, count on me. I will um, continue helping your organization and I will be part of it. If it's possible, if you volunteer, <laughs> I can be. So. Um, just um, express my happiness to be here and um, giving thanks to God that I can contribute to you and uh, do something in my um, Jamaica land, land I love too. Thank you. <laughs> Oh my gosh, now wasn't that so delightful? <laughs> All right, so I do want to pause and acknowledge our, some key people online that has been joining us, has been listening. Um, I did say, uh, forgive me if I did not, that our representatives from the US Embassy are joining us online. We did tell them how to do. Uh, we also have online former director, Dr. Zoe Simpson. How do you do, Doc? Yeah. And, and we also um, want to acknowledge last year's guest speaker and someone who has had a long history of partnership with the foundation, one of my favorite people, Dr. Leith Dunn, also online. How do you do? Uh, yes, so we also want to take this moment to apologize to us. I know you see greetings um, from the minister, from the, minister um, the Honorable Olivia Babsy Grange, and her representative, Sharon Coburn Robinson, would have been giving greetings, but unfortunately, um, she has run into some complications and cannot do it, and we do certainly apologize for that, but we know that they are here with us in spirit and they have a deep appreciation for the foundation and for bringing greetings and they would definitely, definitely want to be up here with us. So we, we send them our love, right? Okay, so we, do, we will be going along. I did have some very interesting things. I was there sitting and as we're listening, I'm understanding that the foundation is in its fourth to fifth year. I did some interesting research and I booked up on an article that talks about what happens to a woman in her 40s. 
And they're, of course, you know, they're always telling many things. There are three big takeaways that I have. Number one, in our 40s, a woman in her 40s, embrace change. And what that really means for us as we are in our 40s is that we are now in the position to embrace change. And at the foundation, we are doing that, bringing in our past, our future to come, and our present. Also, their professional and personal development, they now begin to take into their own hands. And I think that's a wonderful takeaway for us as we are gloriously in our 40s and alive. And also, it is a time of re-evaluation. And I think that as we are in this room currently, you can see that the foundation is on the road to moving through to the next 45 years when maybe some of us will still be in the room at that time, but some of us will have left with the foundation our magic, our spirit, our ever endearing love for the movement, for what it is that we want to see for the foundation. So again, one more big, big, big up for the foundation and its 45th year. All right, so quickly we are going to return to program and we are going to take um, the greetings um, from, let me just get this correct, <laughs> um, <clears throat> from the Assistant Chief Education Officer, Ms. Dasmine Kennedy, and then I will come back up and intro who is coming next. So let's welcome Ms. Dasmine Kennedy. A pledge of mine to, is mine to acknowledge our moderator, or master of ceremonies, Ms. Shauna K. Burns, Mrs. Debian Brown Samuels, Salmon, Salmon, sorry about that, Mrs. Debian Brown Salmon, Ms. Mrs. Venetia Clark Lee. And um, I see SSP, so I assume is senior superintendent. Um, what's the title? <laughs> senior, super, senior superintendent of police, uh, Maldria Jones Williams, and Emiliana, ambassador. You fooled me. I thought you were some Kenyans. <laughs> it's a delight having you. Ms. Bernard Stevenson, right. Um, it's only a pity our honor minister is not here, but we acknowledge her in her absence. Mrs. Martin Berry and your team, I acknowledge you as well. Dr. Carpenter, I'm also sorry that she couldn't have prolonged her stay. It's someone I really um, enjoy listening to. There's so much to learn. And, and so much so, seeing that sometimes our parents or our four parents are afraid to discuss certain language, certain subjects. This is very important. Ms. Shauna K. Burns will be doing the closing remarks. I acknowledge you too. And Ms. Marvet Fair, who is representing the, the Ministry of Justice. I know that I am not able to call everybody's name. I also acknowledge my team from the Ministry of Education. Ms. Bartley is here. Raise your hand, Ms. Bartley. Um, Carleen is here. And Ms. Camille, right? Raise your hand, Camille, from the Ministry of Education and Youth, and specifically Region 1. It's my delight and my celebrities on the front row here. The girls. You are the reason we are here. So clap yourself. <laughs> Members of the media, I acknowledge you too. I am very excited. I didn't know and I discovered today that the Women's Centre Foundation is a November girl. <laughs> yes, that is significant and that now underscores the passion 
that I have for this delicate, compassionate organization. Clap the Women's Center. Yes, wonderful. This is wonderful indeed. So my task today is not really to so much bring greetings, but to dive down a little, maybe not deep enough, into the, the Jamaica reintegration policy, which allows us to extend ourselves in the way that we are doing here today, right? And it's an initiative that the Ministry of Education embarks on, very timely. You look around, you see the lovely ladies who are represented here, and each and every one of them, you know, has a story to tell, and maybe not about themselves, but about other persons, because the, the life of the girl child is real. You'll understand that. The life of the girl child is real. And so the Ministry of Education and Youth, in partnership with the government and the Women's Center Jamaica Foundation, let me say, has a very significant partnership when it comes on to the reintegration aspect of our girl child or our girl adolescent. Simply put, Dr. Carpenter spoke about the age when young women or young girls start to show interest otherwise, and it's natural. And so we've, we, from time to time, we find a number of them getting pregnant. And based on the, what you call it now, the system that we grew up under, yes, the, 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 the high value culture system which we need, tells us that when a girl gets pregnant, a girl is a woman and has no right in formal institution, like, uh, for example, a school. And that's a lie. And that's a lie that Jamaica has sought to mash down. Is who did say mash down the lie? Yes, it's a lie that we have to mash down. And so, in former years, you would have educational institution excluding a girl child once she gets pregnant. And naturally so, because of the strong Christian background and environment that we all grew up in, because you're told that once you start looking for sex or whatever, you're now a woman. And then hence you have no more place in the, in the, in the system, right? So you're now a woman and you're not a child. But interestingly, and I like to talk about the fact that Jamaica, I like to talk about Jamaica as a high middle income country, yes? And that has a lot of significance. The great significance is that we don't have all the natural resources like our development partners. And so our richest resource is our people. And we need our people to grow and to build this country. And significantly, we depend highly on education because that is one of the vehicles that take us to wherever we are. It's education why all of us are here in this room. And so unlike large developed economies, we rely a lot on loans. We are not eligible for grants based, based on our classification. And as such, loans that are taken to help us to develop other country, those are paid back at high interest rate. We can't continue to live like that. So we need our people. We have to develop our people so that they can, can contribute to country and self-development. And hence, if one girl is excluded from educational participation, we just kill ourselves right there. And hence the reason why so many of us who understand the thing and can talk up the thing, right? 
really knows the importance of having every single girl accessing education, not only education, but quality education, so that that, that girl can help Jamaica to position itself eh? in the global market, marketplace, to, 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 to build a nation, I mean, nurture children, and build the country. I am having some competition from the fan, but, <laughs> but I'll try to go through it. So what I'll do is just take off some of these things here. So the Ministry of Education has a very strong partnership with the Women's Center Foundation of Jamaica. And I will tell you that there are seven educational regions throughout the country. And this main center here is resident in region one, the region that I am currently leading and my colleagues that I reference here. These are active participants in the whole aspect of the reintegration of school age mothers in the school system. Because the policy tells us that once a girl gets pregnant while attending school, then naturally that, that girl has to be excluded until giving birth given birth. No, but we can't leave it there because the fact that this girl is so valuable, we have to follow this girl with support, ensure that this girl remain alive, provide all the supports as needed, and ensure that upon given birth, then we find that girl and find a place in the education system for this girl because this girl is what? Is valuable. This girl is important, just like all of us. And, 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 and ends. I can say that this is a very powerful alliance. Any country that looks out for the benefit of its citizen is going somewhere. So you can say with me that Jamaica is trending. I mean, I hear you. <laughs> Jamaica is trending. And girls are wonderful, wonderful. You're a very good class. Yes. So the, the reintegration policy was ratified by, uh, by Parliament in 2013. Late, but still, you know, relevant for us today. And the policy provides for these teen mothers to return to the education system after they would have given birth. And now it is even better because we have online learning. Yeah? In COVID, we didn't have the statistics. We couldn't say how many girls got pregnant. They were still engaged in their, their schooling activity. So technology has come to bridge the gap right here and then. Right? But not only do we just bring them back in the system like this, because you, you would understand that they would have um, gone through some, some level of traumatic occurrences, because we Jamaicans, we can be very prejudiced sometimes. I remember the first time I saw a girl walking in my community in a different uniform from everybody else that I knew, and then she had a protruding tummy. And I became very curious, and I went across and tried to find out where she was going. And that's the time I learned about the whole reintegration program, right? So it has helped many, many young ladies. So in the region and the ministry and, and a whole, we provide for these girls what we call wraparound support. That is very intimate, not true? Wraparound support, full of love. And we, we help them to overcome these psychosocial issues. We see to their returning to the school system. And there was a time when there were a great stigma in the education system. When it comes on to somebody finding out that a girl is pregnant, when they return to school, they hide them. Nobody is supposed to know. The, 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 the guidance counselors who were assigned there to ensure their protection Sometimes they don't even know them. And so some of, sometimes some of our girls, they get lost along the way. That barrier has been broken down. Now today, the girls are everybody's children. They all belong to us. 
So we are not afraid to own them because they are our girls. Yes? And so the fact that, as I had already mentioned, that education plays a very pivotal role in our development, in our empowerment, and in every single thing that we do in Jamaica. We have to embrace it, and we have to ensure access. Access, quality, and participation, right? So, in the, the process of reintegrating these girls, we try to be empathetic. We try to ensure that they are placed close enough to home. Because we do understand the, so, the psychosocial, the, the, the socioeconomic system and the challenges for many of these girls. So we try to ensure that their play, placement is, is, is close enough. Many times, many of them are not reintegrated in the same space that they are coming from. We try to put them elsewhere to, you know, to conceal their identity and to ensure that they are secured as well, right? And um, as indicated earlier, we don't leave them on their own. We follow them up with, with support. And so there is continuous monitoring and there, there are continuous um, empowerment session. I highlighted my team. This is, um, what you call it now? a prominent destination for my, for my team in, the, in, in Region 1. We come here, we provide all the support we can, we, we help them with their little things from time to time to ensure that they feel comfortable and they can move around feeling proud and, and, and they, they feel the sense of love around them. Many of us seated in this room, maybe it didn't happen to us, but it may have happened to our parents. Many of us would have come from homes where our parents started having children very early and didn't even get the, 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 the privilege of returning to school. But one thing they did, they invested in us. And so we have to invest in our girls. And um, not only that, we try to connect our girls to organizations that can help them to achieve their full potential because this is very important to their growth and their development. So I indicated earlier that we are not able to confidently report on girls' integration in the, in, in, in the 2020 period due to COVID. But we can safely report that for the September 2021 school year, we had 41 girls and we in reintegrated all of them. And we, they go to like places like the Art Trust NTA, um, and seeing that many of them get pregnant around the age when they are supposed to go to grade nine, then we ensure that they, they, they sit their grade nine achievement examination so they can matriculate um, in, into further education. And many of them were placed in grades 10 and 11. So in, in, in overall, we had 41 girls who we reintegrated for that period. We tend to do a lot of placement around January and September. Can you tell me the correlation between January and September? What triggers January? The end of the school year in December, right? They're about. And then September. Pardon me? Summer. Right? So a lot of things um, take place there. So in, in, in for the 2022 period, we had 92 to reintegrate. And it's not that the, the message is not being spread. There's a lot that is being said. But pregnancy still happens. It still happens. We have to look for them. We have to clear care for them. They are own. They are, they are our own. So, again, we had 17 of them going to art, 41 of them doing their, their GNAT, the grade 9 achievement test, and 34 of them integrated in at grade 10, grade 10 and 11. And for the January and September 2023 period, we had 77. 
and we follow the same trend. Ensure that they found their way in the education system. So, something that we grew up with, and I'm talking about in my dispensation, because in my home, I never hear anything being mentioned about sex. But these young people, they, 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 they are hearing the word sex everywhere. Everywhere. And one of the responsibilities that we have as educators and as nurturers is to really have the frank discussion, right? Remove the myth, break down the thing, and let them understand what having sex means. Dr. Carpenter spoke about it. Just be frank and just talk to our pure young people, frankly. Let them understand, man, you, you engage in unprotected sex. This is what can happen. Expose them to alternatives. Because the human body is a natural thing. And if, there is not, if, if, if the mechanism is not there to ensure their protection and to also feed the mind with the positive and, and, and let them know how the different options, abstinence, protection, whatever, then they are going to be left out the, the outside of the, in the cold. So as we reflect, I think we have accomplished a whole lot in this partnership. We continue to work with the Women Center Foundation. I myself have taken the whole step further because I am involved with an international agency where I did a fellowship on girls' reintegration. You go and look for Dasmin Kennedy, you see the publication, and, um, and that again further amplified interest locally. And, and there are other things that have been done in the space to ensure that our girls feel comfortable, feel loved, and protected. So we continue to work together with the Women's Center to ensure that our girls are, you know, very much in a better space. But I will hasten here to let our girls know, one is a mistake, but two is not. And I'm saying this purposefully. So, an accident happened in the first stage. You have had the benefit of returning to your educational space. Treat it seriously. Remember, we don't have money pad us. We have to build our own capacity so that we can be independent women. And when a woman is independent, nobody can touch that. Am I wrong or am I wrong? Right. So we have to empower ourselves. We have to build the, the self-esteem. We have to surround ourselves with greatness. We provide it in the schools. We provide it at the center. We provide it at church. Stand up tall. Reflect. Decide how you are moving forward because forward you must move. Women serve as a powerful background for this country. And not only country, but wherever we roam in society. So while we continue this partnership, don't let us down and don't let down yourself. Pick up the pieces. Embrace all the opportunities that are available because they are there. We are here for you. We understand your situation. And we are investing all our energies and all our talents in the process to ensure that you become your very best self. God bless you, and I thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. What did she say? Forward we must. Correct, correct. So as we are wrapping up, I once again just want to say thank you for staying with us. My online people, how want to do? Drop some emojis. Drop some fire emojis, some clap hand emojis, some smiley face. 
we, we, we don't forget about, you know, we're out there and we're listening. What are your takeaways, my online um, participants? What are your some main takeaways? So as we get into our final presentation before we wrap up, we just want to welcome SSP Madria Jones-Williams from Sissoka to... Oh, she's not here. Okay, all right. So I, I didn't realize that. Uh, so, oh, for the question and answer section or for, um, for the speaker? I did apologize and say earlier that we were unable because she had to run to accommodate a question and answer section. Bec you mean for the past speaker? Oh, okay. All right, no problem. Um, you're able to answer no or two questions minimum. Do you have a question that you would like to bring to her? Yeah, man, come on. All right, so we do have a roving mic here to facilitate that. Thank you. I have a few questions. There are some school administrators who are still heavily value-laden in their positionalities regarding accepting adolescent mothers in their schools because they think that it would have bad influence on those who are there. Um, what strategic approach has the Ministry of Education taken to ensure that this does not continue given that it goes against the um, integration policy? Another question I have for you. Um, I'm not sure if the Education Regulation Act has been revised, the section that says that the girl, the pregnant girl must leave school and return under the discretion of the minister. So I am asking about that because the, the legislation would have taken precedence. And if it's, that section has not been adjusted, then how soon are we looking at that? Another question, I soon finish. Um, do you think, based on your assessment, have you had increased number of tertiary students going on to tertiary level? And the part B to that question is, if a girl gets pregnant at 17 and has a child at age 18, are there any plans in place for her continued education? Over. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to repeat them because there were so many. <laughs> So, so, so let me, let me, let me, the um, strategic approach. Let me address the, the issue of the reintegration on, and um, schools refusing to accept a girl. I think we are way past that. We are way past that. And one of the things that was done when I returned to Jamaica from um, having pursued that, that fellowship in D.C., was a purpose. I, I am very strategic, so one of the things that I did was to engage with the, the powerhouses who, really, who are really promoting this, this reintegration thing and, and also strategic as well was the fact that the Minister of Education and Youth, key players, knew I was going and the institution that I was at was just down the road from the Jamaican embassy. And one of the things that you do as a Jamaican, I learned that whenever you're abroad, one of the first places you are supposed to try to find is your embassy. And so the, the ambassador knew what I was doing and I was followed. And everybody knew what I was doing there. And so upon returning to Jamaica, then the, everything, the message was already ready out yeah and so we are far ahead now than where we started everybody knows the value of the girl child everybody knows the implication of preventing a girl from accessing education the same thing for boys and and when i speak i speak like an economist i put it in context um the girl addition the girl's addition to the country where the Jamaica is and what Jamaica needs to grow and develop. When you, when you come forward with an argument like that, nobody can bash it down. 
Already, you just create a platform and you create by in. So it's the same message that we take to the principals. Yeah? It's the same message that we take to the school leaders. Look here. Preventing a girl from having access is like shooting yourself in your own foot. And that, that conversation, that argument wins every time. All right? So we are much better off than where we started. To be honest, from where I sit, I have had no report of that happening now. Right? So we are way past that hurdle. We have become more intelligent and sprightly. Right. So that one is done. What was the second? <laughs> girl gets pregnant herself mm -hmm. and would have had the baby at 18 years. Are there any opportunities for her to continue her education? There are several opportunities, several. I don't know if you know about the sixth form program. Yes, so education is extended, you know, to no longer grade 11, but grade 13. Yeah? And the system has become so advanced we are rolling with the technology. We are trending with, with the technology. So a girl getting pregnant and, and maybe has to stay out of school for a few days doesn't mean that that girl's education discontinue. We reach that girl with the technology. Yeah? So that that girl can access education and, and, um, and pa education participation and also sit the requisite examinations to enable empowerment. And, and so we have powerful partners like the, the, the Women's Centre Foundation. And there are other private persons too who really embrace, em, em, embrace our school children. So that part is covered too. So you see, we had it, we're not only heading somewhere, but we have gone beyond where we started. Last question. It for me, just want to support the point that you make about if we do not provide opportunities for the girl, for the adolescent mother, we, it's like we're shooting ourselves in the foot from an economic standpoint. Just to say that um, a, the strategic plan for the for CARICOM, um, the, that adolescent strategic plan that was done by CARICOM and UNDP um, showed that it impacts GDP, that's gross domestic product, by 2.43%. And from a Caribbean perspective, for each adolescent girl that got pregnant then, it was 2,000 US dollars. And the WHO report also showed at the time that it affects ability, um, disability adjusted life years by 23%. So if we do not invest in the adolescent mother, the country bears the brunt of the economic loss. Wonderful. So, so, so the, 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 the sermon has been preached. Every single girl is important and because we're talking about girls now we know about the importance of the boys but because it's a girl, girl, girl forum here today every single Jamaican is important to this country I, I must tell you that there's a correlation between a girl the longer the length of time that a girl stay in school and fertility birth rate so for zero to nine, if a girl stays in school zero to nine, fertility birth rate is likely to be like 140. If a girl stays in school more than or equal to 13 years, it drops to approximately 12. Great. So it has this correlation, and that's it for me. Brilliant. I see um, I have a question over here. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Being a proud product of the Women's Center Foundation of Jamaica, I have one question. Yes. You spoke about the educational background of it, but I want to ask about the emotional part of it. Because going back into high school, being ostracized and criticized by your community and school as well, what are the programs put in place to foster and to help these girls through the emotional aspect of learning? All right. You know, I'm not going to answer this. I'm going to ask one of my team members to speak. Any one of you? Carleen, Camille. 
So you okay. don't hear from me, you're hearing from the horse this morning. All right, good afternoon. So based on what we have understand, over the years we have been working very closely with the schools. So the guidance counselors, we're working very closely with them. And when we spoke about the fact that we have always tried to lace with the guidance counselor, the principal, to provide the support to the new students, we tend to have the sessions with our um, the girls, sometimes we tell them to continue to come to the women's center to get the counseling. We have to think about the self-esteem. And we always um, ask the young ladies, do not go to, into the institution to talk about the fact that you're a teen mother. We know that most times the young ladies want to boast about it, but we said, this is going to work against you. So we as the social workers tend to go into the schools continuously. We tend to have our empowerment sessions. And when we have these sessions, this gives us an opportunity to have our continuous um, intervention with the psychosocial support. We have to sometimes meet, reach out to the parents because the parents are the ones sometimes they, they stress us when the parents cannot deal with the fact that their child would have given birth at a young age. We have to be trying to empower the parents also to be the, the support system with a strong arm to their children, to their girls, to help them to understand that, yes, mistakes happen, but if you are in your child's corner, this will help them to be improve their self-esteem, able to give them the resiliency, able to overcome these challenges. We know that although these conversations can happen, but sometimes young, most of these young ladies are still in a level where they are still having these struggles. And what we spoke about the wraparound service, now we have um, made some agreements with some of these um, like psychologists where we have some money that is put aside where we can be able to provide further counseling for these young ladies because depression is even they come into play and this also affect them. So the wraparound service is without just working with the schools but we have been outside agencies that we partner with to help the young ladies. Beautiful, and that is very much comprehensive. And I can tell you that when I did that study, many of the schools that I, had, that I went into, when I have discussion then with the, the guidance counselor, we didn't have social workers, so we, so we are more resourced now. So we have, not only do we have guidance counselors, we have social workers as well. One of the things that I learned was that many of them didn't know the girls. They didn't even know that the girls were in the school. What does that tell you? That they weren't accessing these well-needed support. That has changed. Because everybody now understands the implication. And, and when, we, when we sit down with our school leaders and we talk about the things, we are frank. These are the implications. These women need us and if we don't assist we are shooting our own selves so i think the, 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 the sermon has been preached and a lot of persons have been baptized so we are all christianized in the process of girls reintegration and we're looking further to seeing greater things and since it's my last word but I will tell my daughters, stay in school. The first one happened out of mistake. Now, the next one is going to be your job and your independence. Nothing else. Your job, your education, and your empowerment. Only you can take care of you. Love yourself. You're all beautiful if a boy pass and say hey girl you're pretty you know, tell him say you know because you have a mirror mirror that shouldn't let you feel as if it's the first time you hear it and you know you didn't know that you are beautiful and you need somebody to tell you that you are beautiful you are beautiful you are lovely build your self-esteem nobody can do it for you you have to do it for yourself I'm done. <laughs> correct, correct. Uh, before we move straight into our final presentation, um, as we are all gathered here, we just want to say a quick big up to the center managers 
and the students of our Mobe Center, Port Antonio, St. Anne's Bay, Morad Bay, Mandeville, if you're in the house, if you're online, let's do a... And, and then be, yes, let's clap them, clap them, clap them. Let's put some fire emojis online as we welcome there. You know, out of all of that, even us just having a conversation about reintegration, we have a testimonial online in our webinar chat, and she came and she just, she told us, and so we just want to big up Marjo Mundell, past student of the Mandeville branch from 1983 to 1984, and she says, my daughter and I are nurses. I am a public health nurse, and she's a registered nurse and ICU trained abroad. These are products of our foundation. Thank you, Women's Center. Right? So we are gone. We are gone. Understand that? Correct. And now let us please welcome SSP Maldria Jones Williams for her presentation. And we are wrap up. We get in there. Good afternoon, everyone. I won't be using the podium. I'm going to on my feet. Oh, okay. Um, where is the young man who was? While he comes up with the presentation, just to say to Ambassador Stevenson, Bernard Stevenson, welcome to Jamaica, and you are one away. Yes. No matter what anybody says, you can't stay. We welcome you. Let's put it on. Slide, sure. All right, so my responsibility this afternoon is to give you some statistics, so you're going to be focusing on the screen mainly, and to give you some realities of what is happening with our young girls. I am from the Center for the Investigation of Sexual Offenses and Child Abuse, so we live it every day. We see it every day. So this is the reality. Now, sometimes things are not what they appear to be. Jamaica is an alarmist country. So one incident happened and everybody run up and down. Who is wally pa sex? Pitnama sex on the whole place. All kind of things. Sometimes that is really not the case. Again, dep go back. depending on who is looking at the picture and the view that you're looking at the picture from or the angle, it may seem to be something different. Some people may see two old people, and some people maybe see a woman and a man sitting beside each other with some people behind them. You can go ahead. Now let us get into the statistics. I pulled some information from my medical office, and this is only relating to Kingston and St. Andrew from January, 1st of January to the last of October this year. Now, these are the pregnancy cases that we have seen at Sissoka. February, we had three cases. I wanted to look at the age. I deliberately put it there. Do you see a trend? February, look at the ages. March, look at the ages. April, look at the ages. Can go ahead. May, look at the ages. June, look at the ages. July, look at the age range again. Can go, ahead. go back. Can go ahead. August, we only had one. September, we had five. October, we had just one. And the total that we have thus far is 44. And I can tell you that this is not the real picture. This is only what we have captured. In some instances, when my medical officer is not there, they are treated at, we take them to 
a, a medical facility, um, maybe Denham Town or one of the other clinics where those doctors treat them. So we sometimes don't capture that information in our records. So it's more than this. Now the reason for giving you some of this information, let me just say it first, is that information creates an opportunity to make decisions. So we can't make decisions without having information. Our girls, 13, 14, 15, are at risk. That should be the focus of our attention. I'm happy we have some persons here from Sam Sharp. We, I'm happy we have some parents, and even our potential parents, if we are to break the cycle, you need to know what is happening. You have friends, you have relatives, you have sisters, cousins, nieces that are being affected. Look out, these are the age ranges. For November, we have not collated anything as yet, but I can tell you that shockingly, since the start of November, what are we today, the 9th? Last weekend was a very busy weekend for us. We had about 20 reports and 10 of those were pregnancies. So November is going to be outstanding. I can't give a reason for it, but it is, seems to be picking up some pace. I don't know if it's because we're ending the year and people are coming. But I'll also say to you that remember that once the girls get pregnant and they go to a doctor or any medical facility, a report has to be made to the police before they can be treated. It's mandatory. Once the girl goes for medical attention, she must make a report to the police before she's... Well, they can treat them. If it's something serious, then of course they'll treat them. But for continued treatment, they must make a report to the police by law. Doctors and nurses are prescribed persons who have a responsibility to report. Okay? Now, in this, before I move to the next slide, I have a few slides. Let me just say, I'll give you the 34 story at this point. On Saturday, one of my doctors, not my in-house doctor, was working with us for the day. A 14-year-old comes in with her aunt, and she's seen by the doctor. During the pre-physical interview, the doctor interviews them and asks them some questions. The doctor says to the young lady, 14, how many sexual partners have you had? And she does this. So the doctor says, you heard what I said? She said, yes, but I'm thinking. And she thought for about a minute. And at the end of the minute, she says to the doctor, 34. No joke. The aunt that was with her turned to her and said, so you remember the man from around the road? You remember the bus conductor? And you remember the big man from Oversaw? Oh, you know, me never remember them. Real story. Real, real story. Now we are concerned about these things because it has implications. Now when a young girl can have multiple partners and in many instances they are not using any protection, it is worrying. Very, very worrying. But as we get into the presentation, I'll give you some more information. You can go ahead. Now, the majority of adolescents that are pregnant fall within the category of sexual intercourse with a person under 16. They were not raped. There was no sign of incest. They willingly, that they can't consent, participated in these sexual acts. That is something that needs to concern all of us. Why would you willingly have sex with somebody that you don't even know? They meet the boy today. Today is what day? Thursday? And by on the weekend they find themselves at his house. The same day. Their self-esteem comes into question. And in many instances without any protection. Again, we ask the question, where is the parents? Where are the parents? 
We are the guardians who are supposed to be monitoring these people. Why do they have so much freedom? Can go ahead. Now I hope you can see the slide. I it's a lot of information, so I try to condense it as much as possible. Now, this is island wide, and this is from January 1st to the 31st of October this year. The first offense we're going to look at, look at is buggery. Now, for the, since the start of the year, we are you going to ask, I'll, I'll soon tell you why buggery. 46 cases of buggery were reported island wide. Now, I want you to look. These columns say what? Female and? Now, what do you see here? What does that 32 represent? So we have more than twice the number of females being buggered. For those who don't know, it is when penis and bottom collide or intercept. So we have women being buggered. More than men are reported. More incidents of women being buggered over or versus men. Now the concern I have or we have for this is the health consideration because in almost all of these instances there was also contact with the vajay so it was not just the anus that they contacted contacted they, they were in contact with they were in contact with the other part so there are health concerns coming forward i don't want to traumatize you too much and i don't want to give you too much but it has to be said now, I want you to follow this age group. I put all of them in red. That's the statistics for this age group, 10 to 14. Next slide. Now, here we have grievous sexual assault as the next offense. And this is really, I don't want to be too explicit because I can't get very, very explicit because I'm really not fearful. I was in the classroom, so, you know, teachers learn to say anything at any point in time. But G GSA, we call it, grievous sexual assault, is the same thing that we refer to as oral sex on both sides and some other um, acts. But let's stick with that one because that's the most popular one. Now again, I want you to look at the 10 to 14 age range. We're talking about 10. We're talking about people that are in grade 6 in primary school. People just starting high school. They are babies. Look at the trend. The highest number of reports comes from that group. Next slide. The next slide we look at is incest, but before we look at incest, no, go, go ahead. But before we look at the next slide that shows incest, what is incest? Because a lot of people believe incest is just mother, sorry, not mother, father and child. It's more than that. So it, the offense of incest is committed by a male person who willingly has sexual intercourse with another person, knowing that the other person is his grandmother, mother, sister, daughter, aunt, niece, or granddaughter. This is what the law says. The offense of incest is also, because women can commit incest as well, is committed by a female person who willingly has sexual intercourse with another person, knowing that the other person is her grandfather, brother, father, brother, son, uncle, nephew, or grandson. And it is also goes further to say that it's relates or it refers to whole blood or half blood. So your half brother and your half sister are included. The half relations count in incest. And here we have the figures. Pretty low, don't it? But we have the same trend with the 10 to 14. Now, incest is one of those, unfortunately, one f <laughs> is one of those offenses that is not reported. Based on international um, research, the figure of 13, 1-3%, it is said that is only 13% of sexual offenses are reported. 
just 13. So we know that there's a whole lot out there. People just not coming forward to report it for various reasons, but we look at, look at, at the end of the presentation. Yeah, go ahead. Now rape, I wanted to again look at the age group 10 to 14. Again, 111, 111. The next slide will talk about sexual grooming, but let us tell you what sexual, sexual grooming is because not a lot of persons know much about sexual grooming. It's where an adult commits an offense of sexual grooming. If having met or communicated with a child on at least two early occasions, whether by phone, in person, FaceTime, whatever it is, he or she intentionally meets the child or travels with the intention of meeting the child in any part of the world. So it can be local or it can be overseas. Somebody from overseas comes here to meet the child. Or somebody in the community moves from one place in the community to the next to meet up with the child. Still considered grooming. The child is under the age of 16 years and at the time of the meeting or travel, he or she Next slide. Intends to do anything to or in respect of the child during or after the meeting in any part of the world, which, if the act were done in Jamaica, would amount to the commission by any person of a sexual offense under this act. Simply, all it is saying is that you knowingly meet with the child knowing that they are under 16 and you meet them with the intention of committing some act against the child. Now, for sexual grooming, there are no usual perpetrators. Anyone can become a perpetrator. There's no type, there's no description I can give you as to what a perpetrator looks like or a sexual groomer looks like. It's there. Hey, man, it's there. He or she. Yes. Yes, women also groom girls, and women groom girls for men, and for women. Perpetrators usually take advantage of available access and trust, whether it's online and in person. Now, sexual grooming is something as a parent, if you don't pay attention to what your child is doing, it will slip by you. A lot of, I didn't even know that there was a something called WhatsApp, new number or new what is it new what some new group or new something new contacts i didn't even know that that existed before covid and that's where a lot of our children are meeting persons meeting each other meeting older persons doing all kind of things instagram social media well there you go so no they are and if you are not they are quick let me just say that Quick. So you might think they are there doing something on the device, and by the time you reach over there, screen change and everything change. Doing something different. As parents, as protectors of children, we have to be very, very vigilant. Very, very vigilant. Social media is the most un anti social place on this earth. It is, there's nothing social about social media. It was meant to be, but it is not any at all. Terrible place. So perpetrators gain the trust and confidence of their target, then attempts to get the victim to carry out a sexual act once the opportunity presents itself. So they'll friend, they'll come to your house, because groomers are even your friends that come to your house, you know. And they'll tell your little girl, come sit on the lap, and they'll dare, you know, and all kinds of, and promise them sweetie and ice cream and all these things. And behind, behind your back, they tell him, later when your mother gone to market or whatever it is, just go meet me down at the shop. Me buy a sweetie for you. That's what it is. So these are the figures for sexual grooming. Again, look at the age group 10 to 14. Can't go ahead. 
Now here we move to sexual intercourse with a person under 16. Now this is where the teenagers are having the sex, left, right, and center, and they are doing it willingly. Willingly. Now look at the 10 to 14 age group. They're having more sex than any other group. I know you might see the 20 to 25, because some smart person will see it, but this is the age of the persons when they come to us to make the report. So we take the current age. So many of them, the incident took place when they were below 16, but they come to us at this age. So, let's, so just to let you know, there's no statute of limitation on sexual offenses. We have cases that are 30 year old now. So persons come 30 years after to make a report. We appreciate, we arrest people, we put them before the court same way. Yeah, go ahead. This one, sexual touching or interference. Again, look at the 10 to 14 age range. In every category of sexual offense, 10 to 14. Because there are others that I did not bring or didn't highlight. 10 to 14 is the group that is most at risk. And the first slide that I showed, the first series of slides, confirm because it is when they get to 15 and 14, the majority of them turn up pregnant. So that is what it ends up in R2. Go ahead. Now I was also asked to speak about the perpetrators. Now, who are perpetrators? Persons abusing girls. Who are perpetrators? Everyone. There's no category of persons that I can say is this person doing it or that person doing it. Everyone. So we have the range from fathers and brothers to persons that they are familiar with such as other relatives, community members, taxi men, bus operators, side men, teachers, pastors, doctors, policemen, and even total strangers that they have never met or have just met once or twice. Helpers, yes. So everybody and it, gardeners, any and everybody, can go ahead. Now what are some of the causes? And what is it that we are seeing? Because one of the issues that we grapple with is that the girls are not telling us the truth. They are not telling us the truth. If you're not careful, you get, if you interview them 10 times, you get 10 different stories. So that is one of the issues. The culture of silence it hampers us from ma making accurate assessments and accurate decisions when it comes on to their welfare. And I'll just give you a little story. I have a whole heap of stories in my bank, in my memory bank here. A girl, she's, she, she's a habitual runaway. She's picked up by a team of police. She's found at a house that they went to do a, a, a raid and she was found with an older person. She was staying to us. Call the mother. Well, the number that she gave for the mother, it wasn't the mother. It was an older relative. When we actually got to the mother, the girl says the mother put her out. The girl says the mother put her out. Now when the mother comes, the mother bought along the old place. She said, I've been searching for this child now for two years. Yes. When we asked her, what is the name of the young man? If she tell we are no. If she tell us is no. Also, we find that social, socialization and community norms play a key role in what is happening around us. Females, there are some views. There are some views held by some communities. I don't want to highlight any community. But there are some communities that are in deep rural St. Catherine and deep rural St. Andrew that are of the view that women are just with some sex. They don't see anything wrong with a father having sex with his daughters. Notice the S I put on it. 
and he starts with them when they get to 13, he don't start before 13. He has no problem with it and the community knows about it. Nobody says anything. It's accepted by everyone. Females within the home have remained silent. Now we have generational issues in some of these homes. The mother was abused. The child was abused. The grandchild is now being abused. And they all know about it. And not until something significant happens. We learn about it. And we have several of those matters. No, it is very heartrending, even though, you know, people will say, well, we're not too sorry for them. To have a 70 year old man, I'd pull him with handcuffs, putting him before the court. Because he should be sitting somewhere in, with a rocking chair. Can barely walk when we pick him up as well. Now, this one is one of the ones that are, is very, very strong. The living conditions create these opportunities. We have many of our girls sleeping with an older relative and even a stranger because that is what presents itself in their home. And it gives an opportunity, creates an opportunity for sexual offenses to occur. Unfortunately, fear is another issue. So the females are genuinely afraid of the men. A woman came to us to say that she was raped, just, just raped, broad daylight. But she doesn't want to make a report, she just wants medical attention. And she was inside there, and every minute she ran out to look to see if anybody followed her. She trembled the entire time that she was there with us. She said, I can't tell you no. I can't tell you no at all. This is a reality. Naivety. Now when I say I talk about naivety, we have a young girl who was raped by a taxi man. When you ask, why did you go into the vehicle with this taxi man in the first place? Him say, "Mo show me something. So my question is then, you've been, con you've been communicating with this man for the last couple of months. You know, making take a picture and show you something where much care go show you. And you would jump into the vehicle and gone with him. Is it that we're so trusting of any and everybody? Nothing. There's no, no, no warning bell that goes off inside of our heads. A lot of our girls are just naive when you ask them why, what happened, why did you? They don't have an explanation, generally don't have an explanation as to why they do it. And the funny thing is, they usually know that something wrong. There's that sixth sense, you know. That your feet say something right about that situation here, you know. But you still go put yourself in there. Sympathy for the perpetrator. Believe it or not. Some people have sex with men because they are sympathetic. Yes. So the man come and plea in case, or the boy come and plea in case. And they yield because they are sympathetic. Not seen to be, need to be seen and liked. Social media. They want to be a part of the crowd. And they will give in to anybody who comes close to them. Now I'm winding down. Preventative measures. And these are just a few of them. The list is endless. Communicate for, with your girls. Dr. Carpenter said it earlier. Communicate with our girls from early and give them accurate information. There's a lot of misconception in this day and age, 2023. Girls are still believing that they can't get pregnant if they have it for the sex for the first time. Imagine that with all the information, when information age and things just a float all over the place. There are girls who still believe that they cannot get pregnant. Know where your child is at all times. Monitor the movements of your child. It amazes me all the time how some of these girls have so much freedom. They can go anywhere they want with whoever they want. For hours on end. Nobody don't miss them. Nobody don't check to see if they reach home. None of it. And this opens a window of opportunity. Final preventative measure. Make reports as soon as they occur. We find that delay may compromise. 
evidence or place other girls at risk. So report as soon as you hear, you feel, you have a feeling, make a report to us and let us take it from there. And my final slide is how to reach us. Um, the information is there, so I don't have to repeat it. But just so you know, we'll be moving to 6 Upper Musgrave Avenue in, by the middle of next month. Um, we'll be changing address. So we'll no longer be at 3 Ruthven Road, but the notifications will be sent out to our partners and other persons who have an interest. My final word, girls, the world is your oyster. A house is out there waiting on you to buy it. A car is out there waiting on you to buy it. A business is out there waiting on you to run it. Or a big job out there for you to claim it. Go and claim these things in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you so much, FFP. Always with the sobering facts. Guess what, guys? We've made it. We've made it now to the closing of this fabulous, informative uh, lecture. I will quickly have um, the HR manager, Avagay, come and give us a vote of thanks, and then I will come up with the final closing remarks. All right. Thank you so much. All right, I know the time is far gone, and all of us want to go. So we're going to skip the long list, and I'm just going to say thank you all for coming out this, to the lecture series this year. We know that there are so many PowerPoints that came out of the different presentations today. And if you haven't gotten anything, I have one to leave with you for today. Remember, adults, teens, that there is no shame about sex. Let us talk about it honestly and get the right information so we can make proper decisions. And remember, a pregnancy doesn't stop your life. It's an opportunity for you to make a new change. Remember, the world is out there for us to conquer. So don't let one situation stop you from achieving. Do enjoy the rest of your evening, and I thank you so much for being with us for the Pamela McNeil Lecture for 2023. Thank you, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now at the end. Before we go, there are some key persons that we must make note of and thank. First of all, let's see the lights, camera actions that's happening. On a seat, on a seat around. Let me tell you what that's about, right? So we have with us um, veteran journalist um, who has been working or worked with the BBC for over 30 years, Laura Trevelyan. She's here with us to create a documentary on the foundation's contribution to the nation and is one of the causes for the lights camera action. So let's big them up and say our thank you and our welcome to them. In this 45th year and at the end of um, the number, we're celebrating um, certain things. So there are some things that are happening. We also want to make note of Winnie Harlow, who visited our Savile Mar Center, noted entrepreneur, international Jamaican Canadian model, who contributed, I don't want to mistake, but I do believe is 20, I think that's the word that we're, we're working with, 20,000 US to our program, and we want to say big up, big up, and thank you here. Now, there is an interesting thing that I think all of us in here can do things. Now, one of the things that we will be doing at the foundation moving forward is having or is rehabbing after or hiatus for um, COVID is having our charity ball next year. That will be held on May 18, 2024, right? So we are inviting, and this part must catch me on the mic, good, good, yes. We are inviting 45 individuals to make pledge of 45,000 each to aid with the fundraising efforts. Now here's the thing for the regular man like me. Everybody know 45 Smaddy. Everybody know 45 persons. Now if you can get 45 people to give you $1,000, you can be one of the key individuals to contribute the 45,000. So when we think the task look big, just bring it down. You know 45 somebody. 
And if 45 somebody's give you $1,000, then you and your group becomes a key contributor of the $45,000. You see the maths? You see the stats? Good. Awesome. So we will be looking at that. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at the end. I just want to say thank you so much. It has been a wonderfully informative um, lecture series. I know it will be fabulous next year, and you will be joining. Also, we do have PBC Jamaica, who is providing our live streaming. Let's big them up as well. Thank you so much. And I'm going to end with a word from a past student from our online webinar. I, I just want to get their name as well. So big up Miss Tisha Allison. And she says, I am a past student as well. I am now a Florida licensed attorney, soon to be called to the Jamaican bar as well, and a real estate broker, empowerment maven, author of four books, and a mindset changer. I got pregnant at 14 and I attended the Maypen Center. I am now way past that. Thank you, Women's Center. Let's big it up, let's big it up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it has been my pleasure and I hope to see you next year. Big up on yourself. I think outside, is that where it is? You, it's going to be served in here, so for those of